Oh, this is Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Um, I've been aware of the uh, Rockefeller's 2010 scenarios for the future of technology and international technology since I first heard Harry Vox's video that was recorded in 2014. So just allow me to uh, go over and share the screen. Okay, so, and then since then, none other than the, uh, the uh, president of Ghana has, has uh, referred to this document, uh, and he read it out. Um, so just about all versions of his speech have been expunged from YouTube and the like. So uh, I'll provide links to all the most important items in the comments below. Uh, but this made such an impression on me that I would like to read from the document. And I'm sure that you will find that their lockstep scenario uh, from 10 years ago will seem eerily familiar to everyone. So I'm going to jump to this. You can look at the rest of the document. I'll provide a link to it. Um, so in 2012, the pandemic that the world had been ex anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's H1N1, this new influenza strain originating from wild geese was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just seven months, the majority of them healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economies, international mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt, debilitating industries like tourism, breaking global supply chains, even locally, normally bustling shops and office buildings set empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. The pandemic blanketed the planet, through dis though disproportionate numbers died in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official containment protocols. But even in developed countries, containment was a challenge. The United States' initial policy of strongly discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency, accelerating the spread of the virus, not just within the United States, but across borders. However, a few countries did fare better, China in particular. The Chinese government's quick imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as its instant and near hermetic sealing off of all borders save millions of lives, stopping the spread of the virus far earlier than in other countries and enabling a swifter post-pandemic recovery. China's government uh, was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions, from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entrances to communal places like train stations and supermarkets. And even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. 
in order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems from pandemics and transnational terrorism to environmental crises and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. At first, the notion of a more controlled world gained wide acceptance and approval. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy to more paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and stability. Citizens were more tolerant and even eager for top-down direction and oversight and national leaders had more latitude to impose order in the ways they saw fit. In developed countries, this heightened oversight took many forms. Biometric IDs for all citizens, for example, and tighter regulation of key industries whose stability was deemed vital to national interest. In many developed countries, enforced cooperation with a suite of new regulations and agreements slowly but steadily uh, restored both order and importantly uh, uh, economic growth. Across the developing world, however, the story was different and much more variable. Top-down authority took different forms in different countries, hinging largely on the capacity caliber and intention of their leaders in countries with strong and thoughtful leaders, uh, citizens' overall economic status and quality of life increased. In India, for example, air quality drastically improved after 2016 when the government outlawed high emitting vehicles. In Ghana, the introduction of M ambitious government programs to improve basic infrastructure and ensure the availability of clean water for all her people led to a sharp decline in waterborne diseases. But more authoritarian leadership worked less well, and in some cases tragically in countries run by irresponsible elites who use their increased power to pursue their own interests at the expense of their citizens. So there were other uh, downsides as the rise of virulent nationalism created uh, new hazards. Spectators at the 2018 World Cup, for example, wore bulletproof vests that sported a patch of their national flag. Strong technology regulations stifled innovation, kept costs high and curbed adoption. In the developing world, access to approved technologies increased, but beyond that remained limited. The locus of technology innovation was largely in the developed world, leaving many developing countries on the receiving end of technologies that others considered best for them. Some governments found this patronizing and refused to distribute computers and other technologies that they scoffed at as second hand. Meanwhile, developing countries with more resources and better capacity began to innovate internally to fill these gaps on their own. Meanwhile, in the developed world, the presence of so many top-down rules and norms greatly inhibited entrepreneurial activity. Scientists and innovators were told by governments what research lines to pursue and were guided mostly towards projects that would make money, e.g. market-driven product development or were sure bets, e.g. fundamental research, leaving more risky or innovative research areas largely untapped. Well-off countries and monopolistic countries, companies with big research and development budgets still made significant advances, but the IP behind their breakthroughs remained locked behind 
strict national or corporate protection. Russia and India impose strict domestic standards for supervising and certifying, certifying encryption related products and their suppliers, a category that in reality meant all IT uh, innovations. Uh, the US and the EU, uh, the heroes and all of this, struck back with retaliatory national standards, throwing a wrench in the development and diffusion of technology globally. Especially in the developing world, acting in one's national self-interest often meant seeking practical alliances that fit with these interests. Um, where am I? In South America and Africa, regional and sub-regional alliances became more structured. Kenya doubled its trade with Southern and Eastern Africa as new partnerships grew within the continent. Uh, China's investment in Africa expanded as the bargain of new jobs and infrastructure in exchange for access uh, to key minerals or food exports proved agreeable to many governments. Cross-border ties proliferated in the form of official security aid, while the development of foreign security teams was welcomed in some of the most dire fa failed states. One-size-fits-all solutions yielded a few positive results. By 2025, people seem to be growing weary of the so much top-down control and letting leaders and authorities make choice for them. Whatever national interests clashed with individual interests, there was conflict. Sporadic pushback became increasingly organized and coordinated as disaffected youth and people who had seen their status and opportunities slipped away, largely in developing countries, incited civil unrest. In 2026, protesters in Nigeria brought down the government, fed up with the entrenched cronyism and corruption. Even those who liked the greater stability and predictability of this world began to grow uncomfortable and un and constrained by so many tight rules and by the strictness of national boundaries. The feeling lingered that sooner or later something would inevitably upset the neat order that the world's governments had world worked so hard to establish. So that is the, um, the unelected um, technocratic uh, globalist view of our future and it has very little to do with the people. Uh, in fact, the people just seem to be a, um, uh, yeah, a, just a part of this. Um, anyway, um, so I'll leave it at that. Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under.